What is up, everybody? It's your girl, Bonga Victoria, back with another video giving you the gist of things that matter. And tonight, I have a very special guest who will be talking about culture, politics, and Pacifica with me. She is an artist, she is an educator, she comes from a strong bloodline that I also come from, and she is a businesswoman, entrepreneur, and an amazing mom. So I want to introduce Auntie Sisi Unohelu. Onto the gist tonight, this is the first ever featured guest that I have here on the gist and I'm really excited uh, to dive into these topics so welcome yeah thank you very much oh so happy to be here this is yeah, I'm, such a uh, great uh, platform for sharing and talking embracing the culture sharing motherhood talking about trying to run a little business from home online etc etc i know before i pressed yeah. record we were celebrating just your business and some of the achievements <laughs> that you've been able to experience and then also parenthood which is <laughs> awesome i think that most of the people that follow me are one from america uh, particularly mm-hmm. from california who are may not know uh, who you are or your platform i'm mm-hmm. sure that they know um, your family but if you could just share just a brief little one to two minutes of who you are, where you're based at. I'm based in Sydney now. I've been here for over two years. I've spent enough time in Tonga and then now I have to move here. My kids are growing and they need to go to university, etc., etc. But I also have my youngest son um, has um, a rare brain condition and it's better that he, we are here in Australia so he can have access to health care he needs and the support here. My background is uh, classical music. I study did piano in Tonga and then I was sent here to the conservatorium in Brisbane and I spent four years there and then went back to Tonga and and worked for my fa- at my father's school at Denisi. So I was running a group called at Denisi Foundation for Performing Arts, EFA. And so we would perform Mozart and Handel anthems in Latin and in English, but also we would uh, perform except some grand operas in Italian and, and French. And then the same group will perform Metupaki and Otuhaka and all the ancient dances as well as modern dances such as Laka Laka and, and Taolunga. So that was my work for quite some time until 2015 when me and a few other uh, filmmakers uh, decided to found um, the, the Nukolofa Film Festival and started um, showing films lo- locally made and also films from around the world. Uh, we got films as far as Spain and Portugal and India talking about a variety of, of topics from equality, women's rights, to global global warming and water rise in the Pacific, etc., etc. So it was such a, a great opportunity to allow Tongans to you know, venture into the world and see what's going on outside our, our little four uh, corners of, the, of our island kingdom. And from uh, the film festival, made a, a few a little short films films, uh, made Felehu Huni, uh, and also made a little doco about the, the Hawas, the homeless in downtown Nukolofa, which are, they're not homeless, they just choose to be there, uh, begging for money for food and alcohol. And then when I moved here, I wasn't planning on staying here until he was diagnosed with this, this condition. So decided to stay, pandemic fell, uh, planned on being in LA to offer a, a music and dance camp in uh, middle of last year. Wasn't allowed to do that and then decided to offer lessons on Zoom. And then at the beginning of this year, at a, a like a mock-up. It was, it was like a, a test of a, a website um, uh, for those two things. And then from there, I've always wanted to, to set up my own forum uh, big because not only I could teach the language and the dances, but I also was thinking of a place where we can continue to preserve and document um, whatever is left of our, of our history, culture, and, and, and the arts. So that's why I opened up the website and also I'm selling uh, the courses there and I'm also selling low electronic books and hoping to do more and connect more with the Tongans in the diaspora wherever they have migrated to. So much of the work that you're doing is absolutely needed especially for people like myself who are uh, children to immigrants my parents are the ones that migrated so I know little to none 
um, of the Tongan language. And I did marry a Tongan, yeah. so I'm kind of, I get a pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, speaks, a, that's a good oh, start. That's a good start. He speaks all the Tongan <laughs> for us, but you bring up, so there are like a couple of things that I wanted to ask mm. you. So if that's okay with you, I just want to like dive right into the topics of culture. So you mentioned that you are right now accepting new students and that's all so exciting. Mm. What was the need that you saw within the community, within the, to- the Tongan diaspora that led you to build out a language program? I think uh, in, in Tonga, I, I see children there being brought up speaking English because we I think it's it's a general judgment to say that we we think that when we speak English we we are we're better off and there's more opportunities that come with that, uh, which is true in some sense. But when I moved here and, and when I started the Zoom lessons on Taolunga last year, I thought we we really can't just teach the dancers without the language because the dancers. Say, for example, if you want to explain a particular movement, it has its own language. Secondly, I also see the need for Tongans who are further away from Tonga. Uh, New Zealand has got a lot of platforms for promoting the Tongan language and culture. Whereas here in Australia, it's not really there. And further away, places like America, for example, the further you go, the lesser access they have to any of these knowledge and ideas and discussions, etc., etc. So that's why I, I wanted to offer this. Um, I also knew from the late days of my father how much he wanted to translate to Tongan because that's his, his, his idea was that it's, that's one way of promoting promoting and preserving the language, translating and also trying to write in Tongan. So he has written a few books in Tongan because his idea was to, you know, have have the language continue. And and then I think I have throughout the years I've thought about this and thinking along the same line of doing the same type of, of work. And I think uh, we need to catch on with what technology has to offer. And uh, an online uh, platform is, is such a great opportunity for this kind of uh, work and this kind of, of passion to, to to foster and to, you know, put everything there because it will be there forever. It will allow Tongans, wherever they are, to have access to it and, and, and learn a little bit. I know they won't be able to speak perfect Tongan, but it's good to learn the language. The older you get, the more you you want to know about where you came from and um, and find out more about the history of your names, and for example, of your last name, your grandparents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's that identity that that people will will want to know later on in their lives. Maybe when they're younger, they might not think hard about it, but later on in life. And so having a platform like this is is very encouraging. I think there's not a, a lot around, but why not just start it and let's see how we go. I absolutely agree that it is needed. It's needed yesterday for those of us who want to know more about our language, don't feel comfortable or confident speaking in the Tongan language. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you, it it seems as if you are open to working with people who have been called plastic Tongan or whitewashed Tongan their entire mm-hmm. lives. What are your thoughts on that term of being Fia Balangi for those majority of us who grow up outside of the homeland, the islands of Tonga? What are your thoughts on that? I'd like to say my father was Fia Balangi, but he lived a paradox um, uh, type of Fia Balangi, whereas he would just bring out the best of the Balangi world and then also the best of the Tongan <laughs> culture and put it together. For example, he's the type that would have a glass of wine, listen to classical music and talk about Shakespeare. Mm. And then on the weekend, drink kava and sing Quintalote until, um, you know, early hours of the morning. And so he had the best of both worlds. To say that some of our kids growing up overseas with Balangi is too judgmental because that's the only one, that's the only world they know is the Balangi world because they grew up in LA, for example, they grew up in Sydney. It's also our obligations and our uh, job as parents is to give them something from where we came from. Eh? For example, if they were given an opportunity to learn about their culture and where their parents come from, I'm sure they'll be proud of it. But because they're not given that at all, 
So the only culture they know is the culture in LA or the culture in yeah. Melbourne. They grew up in. Those are the ones that I would like to reach out to because I feel that they needed to know more and we're not given a chance to learn about our culture. What you said just resonates with me so much because on one hand, you know, growing up with my mom and my dad who only spoke Tongan in the home and then getting pushed out Mm. into the public education system where if I spoke even a little bit fobby in English, I was judged even to the the clothes that I wore, Mm. the things that would be Mm. normal at church were not normal at my school setting. So it was just this collision of identities that I had to uh, really navigate and and navigated Mm. it uh, as best as I could. Um, Like you said, it was the only thing that I knew this, these were the boundaries Mm. and the the walls and the mountains that I had to climb at such a young Mm. age. Now Mm. having a child of my own, not a young person anymore, where the excuse of not being able to speak the language, it doesn't sit the same as when I was 12 years old. And someone would ask me, oh, you don't speak your language. It's mm. fine. You're young. I'm almost 30 and I can't speak the language. And so there seems to be, mm. I guess, more pressure now that I'm entering into my actual adult years of being Tongan and not being able to speak the language. It's just very complicated. So I'm very fortunate to, to, to know you, one, and to also know that this is a service mm. that you provide for people like me. And mm. so one of the things that I kind of want to pivot because on the topic of language and on the topic of identity, what came to my mind so naturally was Twitter. I don't know if you have a Twitter. I have a Twitter for the sole purpose of following poly Twitter, as they call it. And so poly Twitter, if you're Polynesian, you're part of this Twitter sphere. One of the things that I that I am seeing is poly Twitter uh, almost redefining what Talanoa means and what Talanoa looks like and possibly shaping the ways in which Tongan youth will Talanoa with each other. And so if you could just explain first the traditional sense of Talanoa in the context of how culture is practiced. There's a lot of confusion involved in all these discussions. Firstly, what is Talanoa? Because traditionally, it's the adults giving out directions and guidance. And we as younger members of the community are seen as learners. And we sit there and observe and listen. We never participated in the discussion. And in a smaller setting of Fatalanoa in a family, the father and the mother, the father especially, when you have your meals, he is the one talking. And you're supposed to eat quietly and listen to the guidance and Akonaki. Now we take that out and we think Talanoa is a two-way conversation because all these concepts, when they're taken out of Fontonga, firstly, confusion, secondly, misinterpretation of these concepts. And it's usually done by younger Tongans in the diaspora who have not really done their research and their homework. So they may be misleading their followers. There's a need for redefining these concepts when we move out of Tonga. Second to that, we live in Tonga. We have no individual rights. You have no rights, Victor. I have no rights in the community. We live as a community. We help each other. We share and we have leaders. When we move out of Tonga, we are told wherever you are, you have your own rights. You have a right to Victoria, whether you want to be vaccinated or not. And Tongans are confused with that concept. These are all new things that are challenging us. Second to that, how do we handle that? I see that here. And I'm sure it's the same in America as well. We come here, we don't know how to handle it. The very good example for this is social media. We don't know how to handle the rights to say whatever we want on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And so when we do that, when we are going through that, transition we don't understand and we don't remember that you also have responsibilities for your kainga for your family for your brothers and sisters for your parents so we just go out there and go off with this individual right that we get from the new environment we have migrated to so i think it's it's having these things in a different environment they need to be contextualized for example 
I could say, I don't want to be vaccinated. I don't want Pfizer. I'm going to follow all everyone that are anti-vaccination. And I have the rights to choose. But, Victoria, I have the responsibility for my children. And I have a little son that is very fragile, that I can't go out there and get the disease and give it to him. I have responsibilities. I have responsibilities to my sister and my niece who are allowed to visit me. So these are things that we have to take into consideration and really, really seriously look into them before we start talking and discussing and saying, oh, Talanoa is a concept we grew up because, no, Talanoa means the leaders giving us giving out orders, yeah. the leaders telling you what your responsibilities are. And you quietly go off to your little family, put the yam and the puaka together and come to the forno and provide that. There was never you saying, oh, but I don't have a puaka and I don't have a yam, uh, you know, I don't have yam to bring because I need to feed my family. No. <laughs> See, my cousin who was being sent to Tonga because he's from a Faisal family, yeah? so they wanted him to go to Toloa. And he's from Sydney. No one told him that you're allowed to talk back when the principal is giving out orders. So he's sitting there with 800 students. And so his name was called out because he was late to breakfast. So these are oku, oku in Gaiti. So it means you're not going out on the weekend. You have to stay at school because you have a punishment duties. Eh? So they're calling out the names. Oh, Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this is him in the middle of it. Excuse me, but I want to go home. <laughs> and then he said, he said, no one, no one, no one said anything. You know, no one reacted to that. Everyone stayed calm and he thought, oh yeah, I can do this. Everyone stayed calm because you can't react to that. You'll be joining him staying in Gaiti that weekend. So he just went, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then the, and then the principal, okay. okay. Okay, you get ready. And then after the assembly, everyone turned and they called him, beat the shit out of him. You don't talk when orders are given. <laughs> you know, that, that, and that's Talanoa. Talanoa, I, I grew up with that. We would sit around and my dad would say, blah, 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 blah. And during our meals, and we just ate and listened. Of course, it is a forum where, we, where these ideas could be rolled out and da, da 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 And at the end, we are allowed to give questions and that's a Western concept, asking questions. So wow. we have to dig deep when we, <laughs> when we try and, and, and accommodate these social uh, practices in a new environment. There are two ways that I want to respond. The first one would be, does Talanoa fit the structures of academia? Because what I've seen in recent years is that Talanoa, the word, and sometimes even the ceremonial preparation to Talanoa where a ngatu or a fala would come out. And these are like in classrooms with chairs and desks and they push to the corner, and then when the fala comes out, then the person, not the teacher, not the facilitator, but the student would say, we're going to have a Talanoa because this is what we do in my culture, and everyone sit down and we're going to talk. So my, my question to that is, does Talanoa then fit into academia, or is it another instance of Talanoa in Tongan culture I being appropriate? So. I think the term that comes to mind is vahe vahe. Vahe vahe is, is sharing. So it's it's a two-way conversation. I also hear the word fono as well being used. And fono is called out members of the community to come together and the noble and his matapules would come and lead the fono and then they just start, maybe start off with a prayer and then the matapules would give out. There's a wedding coming up and... We would like to see 10 pigs and da 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 and da 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 da, da and then closing prayer. No questions there. I'm not sure if they still do funnels in Tonga anymore, maybe in the outer islands. Talanoa is, is similar to funnel. Vahe Vahe, I think, is a concept I would like to adopt in an academic environment where we can put down the fala, we make a kava, and we, we share someone talks and then after that we start sharing and we start questioning and we start contributing to the topic or whatever the, the title of the talk is. I am, to be honest, 
Victoria very reluctant to use the term talanoa. I'd rather use bahe bahe when talking or discussing things. Fakataha is another term that we use. So that fakataha means come together. And we use that a lot when there's a meeting and where we, we discuss plans for the group or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But in an academic setting, it's it's a debate. It's someone putting out a new idea or his new findings, and then members of the audience would criticize and ask questions, and they they end up debating and not agreeing on certain things. We don't have that in our culture. Like I said, Afono is a noble and his matapul is giving out most of the time, um, I, don't, I don't like the word orders, but really it is orders. <laughs> or, uh, you know, saying, saying, oh, there's a wedding coming up or birthday coming up or the king is visiting and we need this and this and that and nothings. And then, and then it's, oh, yeah, so-and-so is bringing this, so-and-so is bringing this, um, prayers. No one says, why do we have to do this? I don't have yams to bring. Da, 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 da. Maybe after the, the meeting, but not in, not in front of the noble and the matapulis or not during a fono. Like I said, I'm reluctant to use those terms in an academic setting, but I know it. everyone is doing it. Everyone is running with it, and it's so overused. In academic settings, it's, it's for critical and analytical questioning and, and thinking. It never occurred in our society. I wanted to also ask you about this notion of taking stuff out of context, the mm-hmm. lack of c- contextualizing um, our tongue and mm-hmm. culture. I believe mm-hmm. that it is very common in my generation for people to deliberately take things out of context when it mm-hmm. comes to Italian culture, Polynesian culture, or just specific Islander culture, because it doesn't fit the standards and mm-hmm. the high levels of empathy that is required here in the 21st century. I know that there have been so many discussions around Tongan culture being a culture rooted in shame, a culture rooted in violence, a culture rooted in harm. My question to you is, when we're trying to modernize Tongan culture, Mm -hmm. how do we do that without being perpetrators of taking things out of context and trying to change the very traditions that our culture stands upon. So much of what has been taken out of context needs redefining in the environment we have moved to. Like the concept of a wedding, the concept of having your daughter as a virgin for her wedding night. I'm sure every girl, everywhere, <laughs> every Tongan girl goes through that hassle of having to be a virgin for her wedding night. Well, that is something we can talk about. You can talk to your mother about it. You can talk to your partner about it. And some some families they take it too serious, but they're living in San Francisco, and and they and I don't expect any of these girls to be able to be that for her wedding night. Yeah, there's all these things uh, challenging our, our young people. I'm sure you went through the same as well. Because I, I remember one academic was asked about the role of women now in the diaspora. Women are kicking ass. Where are <laughs> the Tongan women, you know? Look at New Zealand Parliament, you know? There's Tongan women there. There's a couple of women here in local council. There's women doing it on their own and it's something that we need to look into we're not the Tongan woman anymore are we nowadays you know we we're not the, the wife that stays home and cooks and, yeah. and you know cleans the house we're not that anymore right. we have to define redefine what our Tongan woman is in this day and age and our Tongan woman to me is someone that is very courageous, someone who could stand her ground when she's in a in a violent relationship. She leaves. She needs to be on her own and be a survivor. That's that, and that's what we should encourage our our girls and teach them in this day and age. You know, always have that courage and always have that energy in you to be on your own if if you find the situation very harsh upon you. Yeah. That's something I, I, I would like to see that being redefined, our different roles when we move out of Tonga. The curiosity is then, if we're redefining Tongan culture, does it then become a subculture to the authentic, if you will, the authentic Tongan culture that is still in the kingdom? Is it a subculture of that or is it an entirely different thing 
and the light that we hold it up to is not of Tongan culture, but that of Western culture, that we are making room for those leaving the islands to settle into something that is familiar, but at the same time new. What are your thoughts on that? I think the change in Tonga is happening really fast. And I find the Tongans abroad are more vocal in trying to hold on to the culture rather than those in Tonga. Like for example, this kid uh, doing research in Tonga came from Utah. Um, his, I think, grandparents and parents said to him, you know, take your topeno and make sure you wear appropriate clothes and da 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 da. And then went from the airport into Nukualofa, girls with crop tops. <laughs> I think I might have been in Nukualofa that day because I was fresh out with crowd. And then he was sweating in a tupenu <laughs> and I don't know, a LA Lakers like shirt. <laughs> and then he went, and I think we were having dinner a week after and he was going, man, I didn't expect this because <laughs> I think we had dinner and then we walked through town. And we could smell smoking and alcohol, but then there's preaching happening in the middle of town and these kids just start finding an opportunity to get together. And I said, I look at us, I thought, man, the changes here are happening faster than, than, than what is happening with our tolerance abroad. Because I feel that when these parents migrated, say from the 80s or the 70s, they still have that idea of Tonga. And so they come straight with that and put it here in Sydney and expect their children to wear appropriate clothes, go to school, come back, don't talk back, da 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 no sleeping overs, no, no hanging out after school and having McDonald's, which things little girls and little boys do here, which is normal, you know? And so they come with this idea of Tonga in the 80s and then try and, and, and bring up their children here that way. And when they go back to Tonga, it's a different Tonga. So <laughs> I think it's a it's a give and take when you come, when you migrate. You have to to, you know, bring the best and also find something here that would fit in and and, and, and help you bring up your children because it's a it's a crisis. It's a, an identity crisis that they're going through. And I'm nice. lucky I didn't go through that because I came to Australia I was 18. To, uh, as a student, and I, I, I had a pretty uh, balangi, semi balangi, <laughs> Tongan upbringing. So you know, I already had wine and champagne with my dad, and played Spanish music, and and listened to him recite Shakespeare and T. S. Eliot. But I feel for 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 those that are, cause cause I had, I was friends with some Tongans here, and I remember meeting up with one girl after school because I was walking home and I saw her and I said hey let's go have coffee and so we had coffee and da 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 like 8 p.m she went home and I went back home and then the following week I called her and I said do you want to catch up again she goes no my dad my dad said to me why were you coming home late at 8 p.m and I said I saw Sisi Uno and she said to go have coffee and we went and had coffee and then we had cappuccino and you know her dad said what her dad said what's wrong with the coffee here Oh my gosh, that is so Tongan. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to her, joking, well, it's in this cafe, it's instant. That's very different from cappuccino. From cappuccino. <laughs> but she said, I said nothing. I said nothing. Because she, she came from a very strict upbringing. Like I, I remember spending some time with them and they weren't allowed to watch any mainstream television. It was either religious programs or sports. I found that really hard uh, to understand but then at the same time I thought yeah because you know the parents need to and I was in my yeah I was probably 19 or 20 then uh, when I was I started hanging out with Tongans uh, first just hung out with Balangis when I was came here and I'm sure they told me they thought fear Balang and I remember going to church and they thought I was Asian they thought my, my dad married a, a Japanese or something <laughs> I think I looked at look Asian I don't know <laughs> as a parent now really can't be that strict we're not in Tonga so I am not going to exercise any of those parenting here because I want to see you at home I want to see you do your homework I want to see you finish off all your studies and and, and that could be that is just part of a young adult journey is to have right. that attraction you know I and I can't say no you can't do that you have to be this and that this and that it is Sydney and it is the 21st century. So I, I totally can adapt. You know, I think I gave my mom more headaches than I should have 
because she was a stickler to Tongan culture. She wanted me to wear a bodaha every Sunday going to church. And I fought her every Sunday. I'm not wearing a bodaha. I'm wearing a skirt. I'm wearing, you know, a blouse that has no floral print on it like and I'm gonna wear my hair down my mom would beat me until I was like 18 19 and I remember coming home one day and I I secretly gotten my belly button pierced with my best friend who was my daughter's god mom and we were freshman year roommates and I come home and I'm like stretching because I'm not thinking of anything of it I live outside of the home I live on a college campus kind of been inserting myself into college culture and all of those things. And I lifted up my shirt. My mom saw the belly button piercing, slapped me across the face, and then just so happened to go through my wallet, found my fake ID. Like, <laughs> just the things that I put my mom <laughs> Because, again, she was very, I mean, my mom didn't grow up drinking. She never smoked. She never touched anything of that sort. And so she had an attitude and a predisposition to alcohol and drugs and me being the black sheep of the family having tried every drug in <laughs> in the catalog of drugs <laughs> just putting her through so much like she I, I literally think that I was that American experience for my mom <laughs> and um yeah it's, that's just so funny you okay. know my youngest uh, she's 12 she's 12 and she goes hmm Tamarin's got tattoos and then now she's blonde and then she goes if she comes home and tells you that she's lesbian, what are you going to do? I said, I will still love her regardless. But then on the other side of the room, <laughs> you know, this is my 12 year old. This yeah. is how she talks, Victoria. I'm excited actually now that I'm a mom to practice that, practice new ways of communicating because growing up there was always this anxiety um, that I had when I had to talk about getting a bad grade on a test. There's such an anxiety and I'm sure we can get into what communication traditionally looks like in, in the family back in Tonga. I'm sure that we can get into that. I kind of wanted to pivot our conversation, kind of go back to this point that you were talking about, about Tonga changing more rapidly than we are here, out here in the diaspora. The culture is changing. Things are shifting in an alarming rate and how mm -hmm. we're seeing things impacting culture and impacting community in Tonga that wasn't there 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And what I'm talking about is drugs. And so I wanted to ask you, do you, from your vantage point and your perspective, having grown up in Tonga and now being in the diaspora, do you think that this change that's happening in Tonga, do you think that it's happening irresponsibly? And if so, who is to blame here? Firstly, I, I go back to the education system that my father established and, and wanted to promote in Tonga, and that is to set up a school that would encourage critical thinking and analyzing things as they come. And I think that hasn't really fit in or sit in well uh, with the leaders. Firstly, I feel there should be an institute set up to preserve and to promote our, our cultural findings and history. That should be first. Also, it, it, put it into the curriculum and the, and the education system so that we have a strong grounding for our kids of our culture and of our history. In that way, they will be able to think when things arrive in Tonga. I also think that the, the type of education offered and still is at the moment would not even give anyone any form of apparatus to judge or to question anything arriving in Tonga. We only teach vocational subjects because I think New Zealand and Australia has a role to play because that's all they offer. They all think, oh, they're just physical, hardworking people and that's all they need. They don't need critical thinkers in their community. They're so peaceful. They go to work and they go to their plantation and then in Sundays they all get dressed up nicely and go to church. That's all they need. But no, there's a universe of global pressure on little islands like Tonga to try and adapt to what's going on. Things like drugs, 
things like the UN is trying to promote, you know, same-sex marriage, all these things. Who is there in Tonga to criticize and analyze these concepts that are so fresh and so new? We're still trying to deal with democracy. <laughs> we don't understand what democracy is. That's for one thing. Drugs and how these things are being smuggled. It's a universal phenomenon. It's so difficult to deal with in America. Imagine a tiny little place like Tonga. And really, we have nothing to stand on in Tonga. Anything can come and go. Anything, anything can come and go. No one is really criticizing any of these. So Tonga is really is vulnerable. I don't know if you saw in the news recently that New Zealand's government Mm -hmm has given seed money to fund uh, the first rehabilitation center in Tonga in mm-hmm. partnership with mm-hmm. Dare to Dream Foundation. They gave 14,000 US dollars as part of their contribution to this effort. And I did a video covering this. One of the points that I made was how New Zealand will throw money, such small amount of money to a problem that they are largely complicit in. I was looking at some of the stats on the drug industry in New Zealand, and that's a $1.4 billion industry. And much of the time when Tongans are getting arrested, they're not being rehabilitated in New Zealand first before being deported. They are being just straight sent back to Tonga to frolic and do whatever you want in Tonga as a free citizen. We saw that Lord Fakufanua, in his response to trying to deal with the drugs and the the cocaine that's washing up on the shores of Lava'u, put the death penalty. And what is very alarming to me is the radio silence that's on Facebook. I don't see any of that happening around this topic Mm. of the death penalty. And so, and one of the points that I, I made in my video was, do people think that the death penalty is more culturally aligned than a rehabilitation center? That's the question that I am curious to understand. And I was talking to your sister the other night and we're talking about this topic and how Dare to Dream Foundation, although they have great intentions, they have a big vision, they're not clinical psychologists. They're not certified. These are five gals that want to contribute to building solutions around this problem difficult to to understand what's going on because with this amount of drugs you think that the New Zealand and Australian the police force would move into Tonga and try and, and find out more about this when is, is Tonga going to understand how tiny we are in the list of priorities for these countries that give us money to just be quiet and enjoy your kaipola right. Yeah. And, and not having enough obvious change for us to be able to see from outside. It's great to have a rehabilitation center, but can we deal with the drugs first? Coverage by Television One, I think they've done two coverages of the drugs in Tonga, and especially meth, which is done locally. When are they going to move in? And when our leaders are going to be more vocal and advocate, can we get some investigators here to look into this these drugs were (laughs) washed up here for no reason they were heading somewhere we need to understand also as a country and as the people of Tonga that we are being used in this whatever is going on globally we need to know that and we need our leaders to be a lot louder but it's very Tongan also and then we just accept the money and then allow them to do these damages the other issue is the, the fruit picking industry and the industry of getting seasonal workers to Australia how right. many families breaking up because the father is here or the mother is here the younger or the elder uh, the older children are here and they come here not I don't think they're paid enough. If they go back with whatever they saved and bought a secondhand Japanese car and still haven't renovated the house. So there's so much that the leaders need to look at and also be critical of our two big brothers, and that is New Zealand and Australia. When I was working in Tonga in 2019, I got to work with uh, the former Minister of Internal Affairs. She was 
uh, sharing with me one of her experiences when she went to, I think it was Australia, and she got to visit the, the farm that the seasonal workers were working in and also were being housed in. She shared how when she went there the first time, it was in an official capacity and she was there and she was looking at the lodging accommodations and she could tell that something was off. And she noticed that it was almost performative, that what they were doing was for show. They wanted to show Dong A's Minister of Internal Affairs that everything was okay. So she comes back to Dong A and then this case happened. I don't know if it was an alcohol overdose, but someone died. And so she decided to return, but do so in an unofficial capacity. No one knew that she was coming there. So she mm. came there just as a regular civilian and she got to see the real conditions that her people were living in. They were uninhabitable. People could not live there. They were taking, mm. they were going to the bathroom in the same areas that they were sleeping in. And she mentioned how there were several cases of Tongan parents mm. bringing their daughters to the camps and exchanging them for money for sex with the workers. So she came back and then that was when she, one had, I think she had filed a lawsuit against the fruit plant. And then also to the men that were caught having sex for pay, one of the, the consequences that she put in place was whatever village that he was from, no one from that village could go and on the seasons Sorry. for 10 years. Sorry. I imagine that that type of behavior, that, that type of uh, pursuit for improvement, for wanting more for people, like the way that she navigated that issue was just so beautiful. And it's one of those conversations where I still to this day, I'm like, I can't believe I got to share space with this amazing person who, who really brought change. Things are improving. Things yeah. are uh, improving. They post and they do live videos from wherever they are. And look like the living condition has improved a lot. Some factories have closed because of the pandemic. My uncle said he went to visit a place where these Tongan girls were living. And he was taking food for them because they've sent all their wages to Tonga. And they didn't have much to live on. So he, he wanted to go in. Or are they shopping? And then he, he said, oh man, I had to take mattresses as well because... They've closed everything and then they're just sleeping in this hall and they're trying to sleep on the floor and it's very cold. It's it's still cold here. So he was doing all of that to help them out. He said, oh, there's these young girls, like age of 18, 19 and 20. And he said, I can't, I can't see myself sending my daughter overseas to go foot picking. That's a very hard decision to make. And he was saying things like, oh, we need to campaign. Tonga yes. should ask for, for Australia to get more more money, pay them more like how they pay people here and also allow them to bring their families you know if a father comes allow them to bring the wife and maybe the two young kids or whatever so that they're all together so that he comes home after working in the farm or in the factory the wife is home with them together with that separation of two years you know it's 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 hard cases of adultery cases of pregnancy yes. and there was also that case of two boys I raping saw that. a lady at a, at a club i think that was in new zealand or here it's a huge concern and i don't know why our leaders are brushing it off it's something we need to deal with like it, it's happening and it has been happening and it's like we're pretending everything is fine oh it's okay they get their paycheck at the end of the week we need to demand more from from here and also from new zealand Donga, just as a country is loved by like everywhere else there i don't know if it's true in australia but in america there the stereotype is Tongans are friendly, they're big, but they're like teddy bears and they're so nice, they're so kind, they're so giving, so generous. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like there is an opportunity here to really mm -hmm. leverage that stereotype or even that mm -hmm. cultural mm -hmm. practice of being grounded in reciprocity. And I, I feel like if that were to be leveraged in a way to make real moves for the Tongan workers because I don't I don't know I, I don't know what you think about this but 
I don't see Dong Ah shifting out of a vocational focus anytime soon. When I was working for the Ministry of Education, the push was really to get students that were graduating right out of secondary school, get them certified, and then get them on a plane overseas. And so that was like the business model, almost like, we'll get you starting primary school, and we're going to train you and track you all the way until you are a certified nurse, mechanic, electrician, or electrician, and then we're going to send you out. And so that was, that's almost the business model that was being instituted within the Ministry of Education. So I don't know if that vocational focus if it'll shift or if it'll pivot within the next few years. I do think that there is an opportunity for leaders, ministers, CEOs, whatever the case may be, to really make political decisions that are in favor, not for the money, because I feel like that is where a lot of you know, ministers fail, um, but for the health and the well-being of, and the future um, of Tongans. Yeah, you, I agree with you. I don't see it moving any, shifting any, anytime soon. That we're, we're still producing. It's like we're running a factory. Yeah. Kids finish high school, get a, yeah, get us. it's like a factory. It's, and then go overseas, you know, go do this, go do right. this. And if you don't, yeah. if you can't get a certificate, go on this be a seasonal worker. It's a lot of pressure. I wish they could see how cold it is and for them to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and travel for maybe an hour to the fact to the factory or to the farm to start at six o'clock. I wish they could see that. I wish they could see them coming home. It's already nighttime, trying to get a yes. shower, get something to eat, jump in the shower, get something to eat and sleep because tomorrow it's going to be the same thing. Once they hop in here, I mean, they land here in Australia or New Zealand. They they come with a lot of pressure. I feel for them. This is yes. this is so good. <laughs> we talked about so much, and I'm so grateful that we got to share mm-hmm. space and have this conversation about topics that I'm sure there's going to be so much interest in. I want to thank you again, Auntie, for joining me and having this deep. A rich <laughs> conversation about topics around culture and politics. I'm your girl Donna Victoria, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.